Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Christian Minute Podcast. My name is Anne Markby, and I'm your host. And today, I'm going to be giving you 10 Christian parenting tips for raising godly children. I am a mother of three. My oldest is turning 14, then 11 and 7. And so I've been on this parenting journey for a while. And my number one goal is that each and every single one of my children would love the Lord and want to serve him for their entire lives. So I pray for that on a regular basis. And I for sure think that that's possible um, only through the Lord. And so I for sure depend on him to do those things. But there are some things that as parents we can do to hopefully help them along the way. And so today I just want to share those tips with you. If you've been with me for a while, you know that I like jumping right into the meat. So we're going to jump right to tip number one, which is to lead by example. We all know that actions speak louder than words. So if we spend our entire time as parents telling our child, read your Bible, pray to the Lord, go to church, it won't mean anything unless they see that we're reading our Bible that we're praying, that we're going to church, that we're serving. Because when they see us live out our faith, they see that it's real. They can trust us because we're not just telling them something to do, we're actually doing it. Not only that, but it can't be faked because kids are smarter than we think. And they know when we're just putting on a show versus actually believing and doing something that we believe in. So if you are a parent and you want your children to know the Lord, the number one thing that you need to do is to know the Lord yourself, to be doing the things that the Lord wants you to be doing. And I know that sometimes that can be challenging and none of the things I'm saying, I don't want any of it to feel like I'm judging you or I'm calling you out. I'm just trying to give you some tips to show you that there are some things we can do. And having a personal relationship with the Lord is critical because not only do we need it for wisdom to know how to raise our children, but then as we're living out our faith, it's an example to others as to how they lead their faith. One of the hardest things I find about growing up is it seems every single year I hear of more and more Christians falling away from the Lord. People that I would have never guessed, giants in the faith that just walk away. And so my grandfather is 95 years old and he's been a Christian for, I'm assuming, since he was young. And that example of faithfulness through every single aspect of his life, in his marriage, with his children, with his grandchildren, with his great-great-grandchildren, is an example to me. And I've learned through the last couple of years that, you know, being old is hard and that every stage there are hard things. But even though it's hard, the last time I visited my grandfather, he was sharing the Lord with the workers in the home that he's living in. That his age and the way he was feeling wasn't keeping him from living out his faith. And so when I see that, it's encouraging because I just see how much faith he has and that he's sharing it, but it's convicting me because I have a hard time sharing my faith with others. And so when I see him doing something at 95, something that I have a hard time doing with, it's an example and a challenge. And so wherever you are in your life, you know, you don't have to be telling people, Hey, I'm a Christian, just live out your faith and people will notice it. And when they notice it, you have no clue who you could be encouraging. But for sure, it will be an example to your children because they live with you day in and day out. Tip number two is to teach and discuss scripture. Maybe you're feeling a little bit intimidated because you read the Bible and you have a hard time understanding it. And so you might be thinking like, oh my goodness, how do I then teach something I'm not quite sure of with my children? Um, and I don't want that to stop you because the Lord calls children to himself saying like faith is very simple. All we need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, what he's done for us, that we're sinners and that we need him and to confess that. So that is very easy for anybody to understand. And 
I would challenge you and say that if you're reading scripture and you're not quite understanding it, maybe it's time to read a different version. Now, I grew up in a church environment that was kind of a stickler with Bible versions and that had the idea that the New King James or the King James were the only holy versions and that anything else wasn't really acceptable. Now, growing up, I've been exposed to a lot more different translations um, that are very valuable. And so one of the things that I do is when I'm reading scripture on my phone app, and I'm not quite understanding, or maybe I have a question. The app has a really cool function where I can just select the verses and then compare them to the different versions that I've pre-selected. And so then I'll go through and read that verse in like the six or seven translation options that I chose, and I can see what are the common themes? How is this wording versus this wording? And just by reading other versions and just do simply that, it gives me a full understanding of maybe the truth behind what the author was trying to share in scripture. Because we have to remember that, you know, the English Bible was translated from Greek and Hebrew. So we, in translation, sometimes it's hard to get the exact idea. And so comparing different versions can give us a better understanding. So I would challenge you that if you're not quite understanding what you're reading, maybe try a different version because when you do understand what you're reading, it is easier to then explain that to children. But really, it's about sharing scripture with your kids and just trying to explain to them what it means. And in a couple of weeks, I will be doing a session about how to have family devotion time. And I'll give you some tips and examples and share with you some resources that you can use. So it doesn't have to be this big production. It can be super simple but really start having a pattern where you're incorporating scripture in your daily life. So maybe you're just reading scripture. Maybe you're asking a few questions. Maybe you're encouraging your kids to memorize it, whatever it is, trying to bring more scripture into the things that you're doing. The other tip that I have is to pray together with your family. So with your spouse and with your children. So praying together is really powerful. And I did a session a few weeks ago called the power of praying together as a family and i'll make sure to leave the link in the show notes that you can go back to and refer but there is so much power in praying together as a family and i'm not going to repeat anything i said so if you want to learn more make sure to check that out but really in essence is to demonstrate to your children how they can approach god and when they themselves maybe want to approach God, but aren't sure how to pray, that bringing your child with you into his presence. And as they age, they now have example after example of how we can talk to God and different ways we can approach God. And it's a very practical way for them to learn about prayer. My fourth tip is for you to encourage your children and to help them foster their relationship with God. So you can't inherit salvation. Just because I'm saved doesn't mean my children are. Um, just because I relate to God in a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that that's how my children will relate to God. Um, I do believe that we sometimes can experience God in different ways because God has created us to be really different. And so I don't necessarily want my children to emulate my relationship with him. I want them to have their own relationship with them. And so in our house, one of the ways what we do a few things to help our children have their own relationship with the Lord. But the main thing is that we're engaged in church. We prioritize youth group. We prioritize them serving in the church. We prioritize Christian friends. Um, because we want for them to be in environments where people are reading scripture, speaking about scripture, praying together, and them being part of those environments just naturally gives them the desire to also start having their own personal relationship with the Lord. We've also done this with benchmarks in Christian living. So for example, my oldest daughter really, really wanted to be baptized 
and she's wanted to get baptized, you know, probably since she was like nine or 10. Um, and I spoke to a few spiritual leaders about it because, you know, scripture doesn't necessarily tell us what age our children should be baptized in. And it's not a fight that I want to get into because I think the Bible isn't uber clear. And I think there's grace for people to be baptized at any age. Um, but I was really wanting to like, what is a good time? And more than a few people that I respect encouraged me in saying, well, we've waited until the kin kids are teens. Um, and so that's kind of what we did. That's the route we took is even when she was young, um, I bought a few resources for her so she could learn about baptism. We had a lot of conversations about bapti what baptism was. Um, but then we did say, hey, you know, we want you to wait until you're a teenager. Um, we want to see you, you know, fostering and building your own personal relationship with the Lord so that you can then share that, you know, share and tell people that this, you're saying, I have a relationship with the Lord. So when she was a teenager, um, she approached us again and said, hey, I want to be baptized. And so my husband and I, at that point, we agreed that we felt like she was ready. She had shown that she'd been growing in the Lord. That she was leaving her faith out at home. Um, and so we agreed and said, hey, we think this is great if you want to be baptized. But it was really important for us that we not take the wheel, that we were not responsible for the steps she needed to take to be baptized. And so my husband had asked the pastor, he said, hey, like if my daughter wants to get baptized, what steps does she need to take? And so we knew what steps she needed to take. And so we said when she was ready to get baptized, we said, well, the first thing you need to do is to speak to one of the pastors and tell them that you're interested in getting baptized. Um, and we said, you know, these are the different pastors at our church site. Is there one pastor that you would feel more comfortable speaking to about this? And she said yes. And without any hesitation, the next time we were at church, she found that pastor and he happened to be talking to somebody else. And she stood there and she waited for a good like 10 minutes until he was done. And she initiated the conversation. She told him about her interest and it was all driven by her. So we encouraged her and we pointed her in the right direction. But at the end of the day, we wanted her to be leading the decisions about her faith and when she was ready to share that with people. And so that's one of the ways that we really try to foster our children's relationship with God is to make it personal to them so that they're making decisions about their faith and their lives so that it's more meaningful to them. Um, and I'm sure there's other examples that people can share, but those are just a few things that we do to try to encourage our children to have their own personal relationship with the Lord. The fifth tip that I can give you is to instill moral values with your children. So in scripture, it talks a lot about grace and love and forgiveness and humility and generosity, hospitality, service, all these different things. And so it's not necessarily that you need to think about each item and have a specific curriculum that you want your children to go through. I mean, I'm sure people do that and it's fine. Um, but really, it goes back to those daily conversations that you have with your children. It goes back to, you know, being in the word as a family on a regular basis, highlighting different things. Um, one example I can give you is that my husband and I really love talking about politics. And so my children will sometimes also talk about politics. And one time my daughter concerning one of the political leaders said, oh, I hate him. And even though we didn't love this particular political leader, we looked at her and said, you know what? Hate is an extremely strong word. And the scripture actually tells us that hate equals to murder in God's eyes. And so we understand that you may not like this person, but we can't be talking about him in this manner. We need to be speaking about him in a way that can be respectful even if we don't like what he's doing, because we don't know him at all. We don't have any personal relationship with him. We just know what we see. And so we said, no, we're not going to be talking about people that way. 
we can say we don't like their ideas. We can say we don't think they're a great leader, but we're not going to put down their person and we're not going to be then, you know, turning that dislike into hatred. It, that's a line too far in our books. And so that is just one example where we're sharing with our children these values that God doesn't want us to be hating people, that hating people is an extremely strong emotion and that in his eyes, it's the same as murder. So he doesn't want us to be hating others. And so it's encouraging our children to say, hey, like we know it's easy to get to that place where you're hating somebody, but that's not necessarily God's desire for us. So how can we, you know, turn around and think about this person the way God does. And so when those things come up, those are kind of some of the ways that we try to share with our children some of the values that we see in scripture, some of the things that God calls us to. And at the beginning of this episode, I shared with you that faith is about actions and that actions speak louder than words. So if we are telling our children, don't hate your neighbor, and we turn around and we hate our neighbor, they're going to be confused and they're not going to see that we're living a, li- a life aligned with what some of the things that scripture tells us. Now, we have for sure made mistakes and we're not perfect. So there have been more than a few times where we for sure has me- have messed up and we haven't necessarily acted out 100% the different things that we're teaching our children. So when that comes up, we try to take ownership and say, hey, yeah, we were wrong. We shouldn't have said this about this person. We shouldn't have said this, this, and this. And I'm going to ask the Lord to help me in this particular area so that next time I can do better. And so that is also teaching our children how we can move forward after we realize we've made a mistake, that the Lord teaches us and helps us grow and helps us change and to be more like him. And it's not always going to be perfect. And sometimes it's going to be messy, but that we can really practically and actively be living in a way that is demonstrating all these different values that the scripture tells us and the different characteristics that the Lord encourages Christians to have. Another tip that I want to share with you is to teach your children to have boundaries. I think it's really interesting how scripture encourages Christians to be giving and loving and supporting and all of those great things. And I think sometimes that others know that this is how God calls us to live our lives, that we're supposed to be generous with our time, money, resources, homes, whatever. Um, And they can flip that around and kind of make us feel guilty. Like, hey, I thought God wanted you to be this, this, and this. So you have to volunteer right now. Um, And we can feel that that means we need to be available at any moment to do all the things and be nice to everybody. And that's not realistic. And that's not actually even biblical. We see Jesus himself. He had boundaries. When he wanted to be alone, he left the crowds and he went to go and be by himself. <laughs> and then people found found him because they were seeking him and they, you know, invaded his space. But he would then again later on leave the crowds to go and be by himself so he could be with his father. So when you look at the life of Jesus, you see that he actually created boundaries in his life that he didn't have 30 close friends. He had 12. And in those 12 disciples, some were even closer than him. They say that adults usually have like three really close friends. And we see that even though there's 12 disciples, three of them were closer. And we see on the Mount of Transfigurations, those disciples that had come with him, um, and they had just a very different relationship with Jesus than the other disciples had. So God doesn't call us to be all things to all people. We don't need to say yes to every single thing that is good. We don't need to feel guilty when we say no and somebody's like, oh, but this is for the church. You should volunteer. We need to be setting boundaries to so that we can thrive in our own relationship with the Lord. And sometimes some service opportunities will impede our relationship with God. It's not necessarily going to help us. It might even make us stumble. So just because something is good doesn't necessarily mean that we need to say yes to it. And so we can be living this out ourselves, but also telling our children like, hey, 
you know, if you really feel like the Lord isn't wanting you to do this, then we're going to support your decision because it is important for us to set boundaries and we can be teaching that to our children from the very start. The next step I want to share with you is to encourage generosity with your children. There are many, many, many scriptures that tell us to be generous. And even though I just talked about boundaries and they may feel like I'm telling you to do something completely different, we kind of need to learn to balance these two. One is boundaries and one is this call to generosity, right? There's a part in the Sermon on the Mount where it says, if your neighbor comes and asks you for a coat, give him two, right? Now, we're not necessarily always gonna be able to do that because we might not have the resources, but at the end of the day, you know, so many scriptures tell us to be generous with our time, with our money, with our gifts, with our home. Um, And this is something that I learned from my parents because they were missionaries. Um, And for them, everything that they had received, they knew was came from the Lord. And because it came from the Lord, it was the Lord's. So our house was the Lord's house, our car was the Lord's car, and basically he directed my parents as to how to use his house and his car. And so they were very hospitable, I still are to this day, um, willing to share what they had, to give to the needy, um, and to donate a lot of money to charities because they feel this call to be generous. And our generosity is very counter-cultural. A few years ago, we had some really good friends move from Edmonton, where we live currently, to Calgary. And it's about like a three to four hour drive, depending how fast you go. And so my husband took the day off so that he could drive the rental truck from Edmonton to Calgary and help these friends move. Um, and the next day he went to work and somebody was like joking around and say like, Hey, what did you do on your free time? And my husband said, Oh, I helped my friends move. And he wasn't trying to boast. He was just sharing what he'd done. And his coworker said something pretty interesting. He said, wow, I don't think I have any friends who would do that for me. And it's because... My husband loves helping people move. We kind of call it his spiritual gift is moving um, because it's something he's really good at. It's something he loves to help people do. And so he loves loving his friends and he loves helping them move. And so that's what he did. That's a way he could serve the Lord is by taking some time off and moving our friends. But it was also this realization that sometimes I tend to forget in Christian circles because it's kind of more normal is that most people do not have a body of Christ who is willing to support them in times of need. And as Christians, we have a bigger circle than we really understand that if something should happen, usually a lot of Christians will be there to support us, whether it's with time, money, resources. And so it's something very special that we have access to. But part of that is this only works if everybody is willing to be more, you know, generous. And I know for us, there were many, many years where we could just not be generous. Like we had very little money. The Lord somehow helped us (laughs) stay afloat. But it's because he had called specific people to be generous to us so that we wouldn't be homeless. Um, And it was hard being on the receiving end of that generosity because it felt counter biblical because I knew this call to be generous and we were receiving. And so if you are in a place where you cannot be generous with money, we were always able to be generous with our time but also this acknowledgement that there may be a season in your life where you're on the receiving end of all these people being generous to you, and that's okay. Because there will be a time 
when you can then pass that generate like that generosity forward. So for example, when my husband and I first got married, we didn't own a car for the first entire year of our marriage. So we took public transportation and borrowed my parents' car and a lot of people drove us to and from activities. And so when we did get our first car, we really felt like, okay, this is the Lord's car. Whoever needs a drive, we can drive them. Because now we were able to kind of pay all that generosity forward just by driving people around. And so, you know, it is hard being on the receiving end, but there are many seasons to life. And so some seasons may be receiving generosity and other seasons being um, giving generosity. And we can be teaching our children about both. Tip number nine, and, and this is to cultivate a thankful heart. I don't know about you, but my kids love to complain, whether it's food or they're bored or they don't like what we're doing or we don't have enough things. All day, they can pick a bazillion things to be upset about and not thankful. And so one of the things that we've done, certainly with my son, um, is he'll say, it's not fair. I don't get this, that, and the other thing. And we say, hey, I can understand how that makes you feel upset. But instead of focusing on the things you don't have or the things you can't do, how about we pick a few things that we can be thankful for? Because this scripture is full of verses that tell us to have a grateful heart. And science now actually proves this, is to say that people who practice gratitude are healthier and happier. And so God created us to be grateful. And so we can encourage this in our children by taking the opportunity and say, hey, let's give thanks, right? So we can help our children refocus from complaining to gratitude, but also then going back to tip number one, which is living out our faith and living by example, is for us to be demonstrating gratitude, thanking the Lord for who he is, what he's done for us. Now, my last tip that I want to share with you is to encourage open communication. So I grew up in a time, and I don't know, I don't think this was my house, but for sure the church where I kind of felt like there was a lot of topics we could not bring up. Just, I don't know why, and maybe that was just me, um, but maybe I had seen that when somebody else had brought up this topic, it didn't go well. And I know that for our home, I didn't want that. I wanted my kids to feel like they could come to us with anything and that we would be able to receive that without overreaction, without much emotion from that, that we would be accepting. Now, that doesn't mean that those conversations never led to consequences. In a lot of cases it did, but just this environment of safety that they can come to. Now, for example, I wanna be a little bit vague, but there was a moment when one of my children did something that wasn't quite appropriate. And instead of losing it, um, in that moment, I gave them grace. And when they told their friends about this, their friend was shocked. Like, my mother would never treat me like this. My mom would have, you know, a long list of consequences and negative things. And so when my child then gave that feedback to me, I was then able in return to say, hey, you know, would you have preferred that I treat you like this? No, thank you for not treating me like that. And so we can use these opportunities to, yes, that child received consequences because they had done something that was not okay, but doing so in a way that still kept communication lines open that still kept relationships um, and that built 
our relationship instead of tearing it down. And so I'm sure I've done this wrong a bazillion times. And it's for sure something that I'm learning as I'm growing as a parent. But having an environment where our children can be safe, that regardless of what they've done, they know that we'll still love them, right? We're not excusing them. They still get consequences, but they know that there's a safe place for them. I think is really, really important and will not only help them understand God's grace more, but then see faith in action. I can't help but think about that story of the, you know, two people who had debts owed on them and one had a smaller piece of debt and the other had a larger piece of debt and the owner for giving them both. This is a parable by Jesus and Jesus asked the question, which one was more grateful? And the person he was talking to said the one that had the larger debt. And he said, you're right, go up, go off and be grateful for the Lord has forgiven you. And so, you know, when somebody can be forgiven with a huge long list of sinfulness is this heart of gratitude. But the way we respond to our children's sinfulness can teach them about how God deals with sinfulness. And so if we overreact and go completely off trail and berserk, it can have this effect where our kids don't trust going to God because when they came to their parents, we didn't do it well. Um, And like I said, I'm sure I've done this wrong a bazillion of times. So when I'm sharing this, I'm speaking to myself as well. Um, But just fostering this environment of safety so that they learn that God can forgive sins and that God is safe and that they can go to God. And we're teaching them that through our actions and the way we respond to their sinfulness. So I share all this and give you these examples, but also acknowledge that, you know, everybody who's watching, you're a different person and you have a different relationship with the Lord. You have your own history and your children are different than my children. So there is room for personalization. One of the things that I love about the New Testament is when you look at Jesus and all the encounters he had with people, he didn't present himself the same way to each one that each interaction he had with somebody was personal to the person he was dealing with. And so even though sometimes the miracles and the way he healed people had the same result, the way in which he interacted with those people is different. And so that shows me that every single one of his children is different. And so just as we're different, our children are different. So the way we approach a scenario with one child may be different than the way we would approach a scenario with a different child. And so we do have to be open to that understanding that our kids are different and we're different. And so we're not all going to be approaching all the same things the same ways. And so to be able to give each other as parents grace and just trust that like if you know the Lord and you're going to the Lord for wisdom and direction, to be leading and teaching your children and instilling Christian values into them, that what he is calling you to do, we need to trust that that's coming from the Lord and not try and be judgmental because we are all different and God treats us differently and he approaches us differently. And so it's important to have that information in mind. So if you've heard these examples and you're like, oh, I haven't done that or that doesn't sound like a good idea to me, that's totally fine. And I'm sure there's a bazillion other tips that I can give you, but really at the end of the day, it goes back to the number one thing, which is actions speak louder than words. And so you can be telling your children one thing and doing something else. And when you have that inconsistency, it's not going to encourage them to do what you're saying. So in whatever aspect that you're dealing with your children, try to live it out and then speak it 
And sometimes you may not even need to speak it because they'll just see it. So I hope that's encouraging for you. If you have other tips for parents that you found that was really encouraging for you or helpful for you in sharing your faith with your kids in your Christian parenting, leave them in the comments so people can learn and grow. And maybe there's some examples that I haven't thought of that you can share. Um, but if you're looking for more resources to have that Christ-centered life, I am hosting a Christ-centered home bundle and it's open for people to register and grab today. And this Christ-centered home bundle is a collection of 32 free products to help Christian women establish a strong foundation for their family spiritual life and cultivate a home environment that honors God. So if you want to check out all the resources in this bundle, I encourage you to do that right now. You can go to www.onedeterminedlife.com forward slash bundle to see everything that's available. You can sign up for them today and have those resources in your email box right now. So go ahead and do that and come back to me next week as I will be sharing you some very specific strategies for teaching and modeling Christian values to your children. So I'll give you even more examples and more tips next week. So I hope to catch you then. Thank you for joining me. Bye.